Greetings, family. Welcome back. Uh, we're into the fifth month of the year, so we're halfway through 2024. And a lot has been going on. I don't want to have a discussion with you or presentation and maybe in the future have a discussion about some of these various topics I'm going to talk about. Media events, you know, we've had this eclipse, solar eclipse in past April. Uh, we got uh, media hype, some movies, talk about that. And uh, some events that happen on a grand scale in the water, like with the tanker, we'll talk about that. And then just the current genocide that's going on against oppressed people that's happening right now. How did that start? Uh, we got the Olympics coming. We'll address that. You know, we got the 2024 presidential election coming. So I wanted to present this by talking about, you know, memory. Things don't happen out of the blue. They happen for a reason. It's cause and there's effect. So memory helps you to deal with the future. Memory helps you to recover your past but also let you know where you need to be going so we want to look at 2024 and all the challenges and travails that have occurred but we also want to process so i'm going to serve as your memory recovery specialist today to uh break some things down for you it's important to have that brain working right and sometimes the only way you can do that is having some books and we'll share some books to read so did you, uh, there's a novel out, or there was a novel called Leave the World Behind, and a movie was made out about this. I don't know if you saw that, but in 2023, some interesting connections. So the uh, scenario, you know, a family, you know, went back to their home and there's another family that was using their home like an Airbnb, and there's the conflict between black and white, you know, racial politics that come into play, and uh, all the, Electronics are down. And even in 2024, we had something happen with, I think it was AT&T. The uh, network went down and people had no power on their cell phones and couldn't <laughs> chat. And people were worried about what's going on with his movies describing what would really happen. Fictitiously, but what would happen in those scenarios. So pretty intense movie. There were some scenes in there that led to, you know, potential death and shootings. But there was a scene in there, very beginning, where a freight liner was coming on shore. Freight liners don't come on shore. This is 2023, the movie's coming out. Freight liners don't come on shore. They are way out there in the ocean. And then they dock where they're supposed to when they are dropping off their freight. But here you have this freight liner in the movie and people were saying well, they kept seeing it coming and coming and so the connection i'm making here is march 26 2024 you had a freight liner that hit a bridge the francis scott key bridge in baltimore maryland devastated they say it lost power got lost control they said bad gas whatever the story is it's now in a crime scene investigation so you have the movie movie showing a ocean liner coming on shore now you have an ocean liner crashing to a bridge this never happened so these connections and we already know like i said we had that solar eclipse in 2024 actually it was uh, april i think 8th we had a solar eclipse and when that solar eclipse happened it let, really led me to read up on some other work i'm going to talk about this a little later on but the colfax massacre happened april 13th i'm going to talk about that when i read a little bit past it from negroes and the gun. Speaking of gun, there's a movie out also called Civil War. Came out in 2024. And it was about the Western forces, uh, fascist people fighting against one another, but right here in America. It reminded me of the Purge movies. And one of the Purge sequels is called Election Year. And yes, we are in election year. It seems like are these preludes to say what's going to happen and what's going on in our world? So if you watch the movie Civil War, I wasn't too thrilled about it. Uh, to me, it wasn't that exciting. It was directed by Alex Garland. He's from London, so it's not from this cultural experience. So it was just interesting why the same storyline, the first black, first person to get killed was the brother. He had all the weaponry, had the, you know, machine gun, had the you know, protection, but black guy gets killed. 
even in the movie you got a black woman shot another black woman and I believe at the end of the movie the black woman killed the president it's like where's that coming from so we shouldn't even been in there because we're not the ones that did that reser was an insurrection to the White House <clears throat> that wasn't us so we shouldn't even be in this but we had some melanated actors performing so it's, ficti it's fictional and uh but it's talking about really what we feel like it's coming with people fighting one another here in our own government but the storyline is really talking about the journalists and telling the story from their perspective so it sounds like the old story of a uh, white woman save the day movies that's what it seemed to be like so if you talk about where we are today with this devastation of Kenny called a war but the massacre that's going on internationally I want us to think about some figures that have been instrumental in war and these three particular individuals I'm not even putting the names up because I want you to be able to know they are know who they are but also research on your own it's unfortunate that we know so much about this big beat between what Drake and Kendrick Lamar right now and we had this before with Tupac and Biggie and all that is irrelevant to the real world. Those are distractions. Like Caitlin Clark, she was in Iowa and now I'm going to the WNBA and the NBA and the, what do you call it, the playoffs and it's all distractions because they mean nothing when you have no electricity, you have no water, you have no food. So these particular individuals were very instrumental in world politics. So the man on your left there, that's Ralph J. Bunch he got the first Nobel Peace Prize as a African black or melanin man. So why did he get it? Well, talk about that. The other gentleman right there on the top, that's Colin Powell. Colin Powell, he served as Secretary of State under the Bush administration. And he was involved in that Iraqi fiasco you know the weapons of mass destruction may his soul rest in peace he's gone now but Colin Powell was not on the right side of the world when that was going on but he was serving this nation people want him to run for president he chose not to was he gonna run as a Republican we don't know but we'll also talk about that dynamic too about who is supportive of black interests and is waxed and waned and changed over the years Fellow on the bottom is Lloyd Austin. He's the uh, first black secretary of defense. Hmm. Implicated in some challenging scenarios right now. So if he's supporting the empire, that means he's not really supporting African interest. He's supporting the corporate interest. So he's implicated in the bad state of affairs that's going on in the massacre over there in uh, Palestine. But what about Palestine? Ralph J. Bunch got this piece Prize because he brought the Palestinians and the Israelis together, or the Arabs and the Israelis together to try to create a truce. So this 1949 armistice agreement, June 1947 to 1949, Bunch worked on the most important assignment of his career because he was around. He did some things. He was ever in the, even in Africa in the Congo, and he actually was a board of trustee member for Lincoln University, my alma mater. So he was very active. He was a political science teacher chaired the department site of political science at Howard University so he was very active and in the community valedictorian when he was in grade school valedictorian I think when he graduated from college I mean Ralph J Bunch was the man so he helped to deal with the confrontation between the Arabs and Jews in Palestine he was first appointed to as assistant to the UN special committee on Palestine then as principal secretary of the UN Palestine Commission which was charged with carrying out the partition approved by the UN General Assembly. In early 1948, when this plan was dropped and fighting between Arabs and Israelis became, Israelis became especially severe, the UN appointed Count Wolf Bernadotte as mediator and Ralph J. Bunch as his chief aide. Four months later, in September 17th, 1948, Count Bernadotte was assassinated, probably by some Jewish zealots and uh, people on the wrong side or don't wanting this not wanting this to happen and Bunch was named acting UN mediator on Palestine after 11 months of virtually ceaseless negotiating Bunch obtained signatures on armistice 
agreements between Israel and the Arab states. Didn't necessarily say Palestine, but the Arab states. So this armistice it was signed between Israel, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. Didn't say Palestine. Hmm. They weren't at the table, sounds like. The armistice demarcation line was drawn for the most part along the 1922 international border between Egypt and mandatory Palestine. I'll show you the map shows that, but mandatory Palestine? Hmm, what is that? Except near the Mediterranean Sea, where Egypt remained in control of a strip of land along the coast, which became known as the Gaza Strip. And that's where the massacres are occurring today. It's mandatory Palestine. I thought maybe we were saying it was a mandatory place to have the Palestinians to have their own place. Mm -mm. It meant a mandatory place for those Israelis to have that Palestine. So it's a complicated matter. Two state solution is proposed by some. One state solution, most don't agree. So it's a complicated matter. So yes, Ralph J. Bunch in 1950 got the Peace Prize for trying to bring these people together. So we have to ask the question though, did he maybe set the Palestinians up and create a situation where just like Lloyd Austin right now is making decisions for the empire, but not for the oppressed people. Colin Powell went and attacked Iraq under false pretenses of weapons of mass destruction. So you have black people involved in the politics of this country and sometimes it's not in the best interest of those people who are being exploited. The Balfour Declaration 1917 in which Britain promised its support for the establishment of Jewish national home in Palestine. So that's 1917. It didn't happen until 1948. Mandatory Palestine was then established in 1920 and the British obtained a mandate for Palestine from the League of Nations in 1922. So there's always an ongoing thrust for this term coming up called Zionism. And now you have the politics of people saying that if you use Zionism or you're anti-Zionist, then you must be anti-Semitic. And so people are trying to pass laws to have an impact on the words you're using. So this is the location we're saying that's mandatory Palestine is where the Palestinian people were. That's holy land. This was now given to the Israelis. So competing interests of the two populations led to the 1936-1939 Arab Revolt. So people like, we're not going to accept this. No, this is not going to go. You can't just take the land and then put somebody there. So during this time period of 1944-1948, the Jewish insurgency in mandatory Palestine was occurring. And right now with all the land that's being destroyed and, dis and the destruction that's happening, people now, those individuals want to come in now and build on that to create a new world for them. So the United Nations partition plan for Palestine to divide the territory into two states, one Arab and one Jewish, was passed in 1947. And then we have the establishment of the state in 1948. So this is perpetual conflict. So something happened in October of this year, well, October 2023, where the Palestinians bombs someplace in Israel Israel then took it upon themselves to say, hey, we got to respond. And guess what? This is nothing new. This is a game that's being played. Got this book by John Pilger called The Rules of the World. I'm going to read something to you that shows you that this is nothing new. This is our planned activities, and we just don't put it in perspective about how it's happening. Some of these books will show you what I'm trying to say. So during the mandate, area saw successive waves of Jewish immigration and the rot it sounds like gentrification in many of the black neighborhoods or oppressed neighborhoods throughout the world. Many countries are going through this where you got the settler colonialist mentality. The world, I got this book called The World, I haven't read it yet, The World Turned Inside Out. Settler colonialism as a political idea. Some people think that this is the way to go. So they run people off their own land. So the rise of nationalist movements in both the Jewish and Arab communities, this is what created the whole conflict between Hamas and then Israeli military and just perpetual conflict. Competing interests of the two populations led to the 1936-1939 Arab revolt in Palestine and in 48, Jewish insurgency the mandatory in, in, in mandatory Palestine was increasing. So 
The United Nations partition plan to, for Palestine to divide the territory to two states, one Arab, one Jewish, has passed. And here comes the Melman man that is to try to rescue or create the demise. So that's where I'm saying Ralph J. Bunch's contributions are complicated. He got a peace prize, but hey, so did Obama. But he was killing. He was a war person. He killed Gaddafi, an African, but he got a Nobel Peace Prize. So we have to look at the challenges of how others are approving your work. As long as you're loyal. So as the 1948 establishment was occurring, something was going on, a word called Nakba that the Arab population recognizes as the catastrophe. It was the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and mandatory Palestine. So again, I thought mandatory Palestine was at least give the Palestinians a place to be had, to be theirs. Nope. It meant this is going to be someone else's. The settler, colonizer. So through this war, through their violent displacement and dispossession of land, property, and belongings, along with the destruction of the society, culture, identity, political rights, and national aspirations. Now this is intriguing because it's almost like this is nothing new. This is apartheid. This happened in South Africa. Guess what? Israel supported South Africa. Hmm. My father was very important, involved in, involved in the uh, divestiture movement back in the 70s. He, along with Randall Robinson and other you know, activists, were trying to get the United States to divest from South Africa. The same way that now people are protesting to say divest from Israel. Because those policies are bad for the people. So this is basically apartheid. Hmm, I wonder where they got that from. I wonder where they were supporting, who they were supporting. So throughout South Africa and that apartheid movement and in Israel, apartheid now, it's all connected. So if you have a community and you have a dog running loose, guess what? It might be a pit bull. Oh my goodness, what is this pit dog bull running around my neighborhood? Who do you call to fix this? It's, a, it's running rampant. So there's the problem. Who's there to check this? And so now with this loose pit bull, we have all these problems in our world right now and we see what's going on with uh, uh, the protests. You have people protesting on campuses. A college university environment where you're supposed to grow and you have administrations attacking students who are asking about where their money is going, how their money is being utilized. That's criminal. So if we have a society right now that is not listening to the citizens, that's why this presidential election is going to be problematic for the current or the incumbent person. Because if you're not listening to the people, revolution and change is going to happen and is going to occur. So let's see. When I make this connection between then Israel and South Africa, I have this book called Unfinished Business. South Africa, Apartheid and Truth. So it talks about how that Truth and Reconciliation Committee and those meetings that were held, they didn't really deal with the sources and didn't address the issues. But I saw this one interesting part in here. So it's about Kenneth Kawanda, Zambia president. Again, you have Zambia and Zimbabwe that were uh, you know, originally named Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia after Cesar Rhodes. But during independence, you had the Africans renaming those countries. But Kenneth Kwanda from Zambia, some of these people started be becoming collaborators with the Europeans that were there on the continent, the colonizer. Kwanda showed his gratitude to Worcester, who was one of the uh, South African leaders, by ensuring that several potentially troublesome South African exiles working in Zambia were moved on, like, you know, President Felix Hufet Boyne Cote d'Ivoire also hosted Worcester. Worcester. So basically, you got the Cote d'Ivoirean, Ivory Coast president, kind of in cahoots with the colonizer. And what I found out from other books is that he worked to overthrow Nkrumah. So you're not a pan Africanist. Also hosted Worcester, and also Michelle Rudy had brokered a meeting. 
President Leopold Senghar. This is problematic because he was one of the fathers of the negritude movement of Senegal follows suit. And here's the part that I'm saying relating to the uh, connection between Israel and South Africa. Contacts were also being established with Sudan's dictatorial Muhammad before Al Nimri and with Egypt, while closer ties with Israel saw the one time follower of Adolf Hitler visiting the Zionist state as a guest of honor. They're all in collaboration with one another. You start to think about the, the nature, I don't know if you ever read Junior Junuezu. The West and the rest of us, white predators, black slavers, and the African elite. This is what we just described in that book on unfinished business, how the African elite get controlled by the powers that be. Uh, this is an old school book by old school Harold Dix. His name changed to Nana Eko Ntweko. But 500 years of European behavior, its effects on African African people. So if we don't study what has been going on, guess what? You're gonna repeat the same stories. That's why it's important to go to a black bookstore and get a black book. Bookstore. Of course, you can go to Amazon somewhere else, but is Amazon gonna sell, I don't know, the protocols of learned elders of Zion? Hmm. Jewish people say, this is phony, this is fake. That's why they had it burned years ago. But you start reading it, you start looking at some of the topics. We name presidents, we control elections. Hmm. We determine wars? Oh my goodness. You gotta maybe take a peek at this. And even those individuals that they say that are there in that land, Arthur Kessler wrote a book called The 13th Tribe. The Khazarian Empire. It talks about the source of those people who are the colonizers there in Palestine. This book traces the history of the ancient Khazar Empire, a major but almost forgotten power in Eastern Europe which in the Dark Ages became converted to Judaism. Mm. Zaria was finally wiped out by the forces of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan was the man back in the day. He was bad for white people. Why? He was kicking white people's butt. But Genghis Khan is like the Malcolm X of the people in Mongolia. Because like, wow, Genghis Khan was the man. He was helping us. It's like we say now, Malcolm X was no violent person. He wasn't the devil. Malcolm X was a strong figure for the revolution of the mind. So they were looking like, Genghis Khan the same way, but it says, but evidence indicates that the Khazars themselves migrated to Poland and formed the cradle of Western Jewelry. And then the whole story has been told about the Holocaust and now they use that story like they're the only people that have ever been targeted and that's not the case. But check this out. This is a uh, John Pilger, New Rules of the World, may his soul rest in peace. He passed away December 2023, just passed. But listen to this story line about this connection we're making here on no other subject are the boundaries of objective reporting more finely drawn than israel this is now written in 2002. he's written right like 20 plus years ago for 35 years at least palestinians have been denied a right of return to their homes in breach of numerous united nations resolutions and international law in demanding Israel's withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza, the Security Council used words strikingly similar to those that demanded Iraq's withdrawal from Kuwait in 1990. Now remember, Saddam Hussein was set up. He asked, is it okay that I go because these people are slant drilling into Iraq? I'm going to invade Kuwait. The United States said, oh, what you got to do? Check the record. April Glaspie, all these people in the cabinet. Bush administration? Oh, go ahead. They set him up. When Iraq did not comply, it was attacked by an American-led coalition and Kuwait was liberated. And we now know all that was a joke because of the weapons of mass destruction that weren't even found. All that oil burned up, all those people killed, Saddam Hussein decimated. I mean, this is history. Are you paying attention? When Israel has not complied, it has received increased Western, principally American, economic and military support. And that's why the people in America, the people are protest. You're massacring children and you're now still giving weaponry to the people. This is 2002. With honorable exceptions, events in Palestine are reported in the West in terms of two warring rivals, 
not as the oppression of an illegal occupier, Israel, and the resistance of the occupied, Palestine. The Israel regime continues to set the international news agenda. Israelis are murdered by terrorists, while Palestinians are left dead after a clash with security forces. Distinction is rarely made between a huge nuclear armed military force with tanks, fighter jets, helicopters, gunships, and crowds of youth with gunshots and slingshots. And so again, people today are protesting because you're sending this weaponry against people with slingshots. Where where is the morals under the so now Pilger's a from England, so English right. So he says under Blair, British support for Israel repression has accelerated, and it is till to this day same thing. During 2001, with 650 Palestinians killed by the Israelis, mostly civilians and many of them assassinations, the government proved. 91 arms exports licensed to Israel in categories that included ammunition, bombs, torpedoes, rockets, missiles, combat vessels, military, electronic imaging equipment, and armored vehicles. That's why people are protesting today. So if you have a problem with people protesting because they don't want that to happen, we have a society that is fractured. Yes, the divided states of what? America. Blair's re su support of the Saran regime goes even deeper. Now, again, this is written 20 plus years ago. In May of July 2001, the authoritative Jane Foreign Report disclosed that Britain and France had given the green light to Saran to attack Arafat if the Palestinian resistance did not stop. The British government was shown a plan for an all out Israeli invasion and reoccupation of the West Bank and Gaza, using the latest F-16 and F-15 jets against all the main installations of the Palestinian Authority. However, the Israeli plan needed, to su needed a suicide bomb blast which causes numerous deaths and injuries. The revenge factor is crucial. The revenge factor is crucial. It would motivate Israeli soldiers to demolish the Palestinians. I gotta repeat that. repeat that again. It would motivate Israeli soldiers to demolish the Palestinians. So it says here on November 23rd, 2001, Israeli agents assassinated the Hamas leader, Mahmoud Abu Hanoud. 12 days later, the inevitable response came in coordinated suicide, suicide attacks against Israel. Now, you follow the media, you see that's what's going on right now. The United States does something to Iran, Iran now goes against your embassy, and now you got these, it's, it's tit for tat. But what happened in October in 2023 was set up to now say, oh, no, 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 they attacked us, we now gotta wipe them out. They've been thinking about that. It just shows you that that NAPCA, that, that 1848, they've been working on ways to wipe them out. Whoever decided upon this liquidation of Abu Hanud knew in advance that that would be the price. Okay, we got some suicide attacks. Some of us die. We're gonna kill all of them. Hmm. That's the thinking. That's what European behavior. What's that book I have? Five hundred years. European behavior. Whoever gave a green light to this act knew full well that there is thereby shattering in one blow the gentleman's agreement between Hamas and Palestinian Authority not to play into Israel's hands by mass attacks on its population centers. So since it happened, you bombed us, we're gonna wipe you out. But it was set up, they did it, they provoked them. On cue, Sharon's forces attacked the occupied territories with unprecedented force. This is 20 years ago, folks. You see what's happening now? It was all set up and staged, all but destroying the Palestinian Authority and Arafat's political base. The Americans issued the usual anodyne, that's a K-N-O-D-Y-N-E, that's like no dissent, not saying anything, about ending violence, this time placing most of the responsibility on Arafat. Come on. Just 
Look at this one, population control. How corporate owners are killing us. I read a little bit about this before, but there's a, his last chapter, 23, is called Coming Collapse. I just wanna read a segment here. Most citizens today cannot imagine such a possibility because they are psychologically affected by a phenomena known as normalcy bias, whereby people fail to recognize or underestimate the possibility of disaster. So all these people who are now over here not seeing the blown by up bodies, the stench and the smell of death and it not being part of your reality, you have enormously bias. Like, oh, well, this is news. Couldn't happen here. Yes, it could happen here. That's why people are protesting to ensure that this doesn't happen anywhere. So this bias, most people tend to believe that whatever they experience on a day-to-day -day basis is normal and that things will stay that way. Such bias prevents them from considering the ramifications of current trends. So unable to process really what's going on. That's why if people who are criticizing those who are protesting now, what's really going on with you? If you have a problem with people trying to fight for those who are oppressed. He concludes this part, this chapter on the failures of centralized government aside. So centralized government, that's what we're supposed to have in America. Uh, I don't know. This is the United States of America. This is the government, but I don't know. It's fractured. You go to other countries that are practicing socialism. I got this paper. I don't know if people still read papers. Workers World. Uh, it talks about socialism, but I visited some socialist countries and they seem to be doing quite well. So this so-called fight between capitalism and, and socialism has been a problem throughout the world, but we have to start learning from others. The failures of centralized government aside, many feel it is long past time for the American people to cast off the blinders imposed on them by the corporate mass media and view the reality of their death dealing society to truly move toward a future that values life over death. I just find it intriguing that here we have this death going on in this gigantic situation and this horror and this chaos, but you, is Bill Gates around anywhere? Hmm. How about Anthony Fauci? Hmm. They were all up in your news and your stories and your TV and your media when the so-called pandemic was here. Here's another problem, a worldwide scale problem. I mean, they weren't experts in that area that they were trying to rectify. So why aren't they talking about this now? Because where did they go? Hmm. So people are silent when it comes down to just power and this control. So we need to put ourselves in perspective that no one's coming to save you. That's why people are protesting. You gotta save yourself. Be warned. This could lead to a new and shocking worldview as many may learn that the much discussed new world order is simply the old world order. That the means of ex exercising power are the same, only the technologies have changed. The Caesars of, and kings of yesterday became the robber barons of the 19th and 20th centuries, who in turn have become the corporate owners of today. Just think about fraud and American history from Barnum to Madoff, Madoff. So Bernie Madoff and that's P.T. Barnum talking about the circus. And I don't know, this is like, this is by Edward Ballison. This was written in 2017. So I guess the next version will have a picture of a guy named Donald Trump on the front of this. But fraud, it's rampant. These self-styled globalists believe themselves to be more enlightened, entitled by heritage, and therefore more worthy than others to rule the world. That's why, unfortunately, Biden made a mistake by saying that he knows what's best. And you got to oppress people being killed. And though their ownership of the multinational corporations that control governments and even our food, water, and pharmaceuticals, they are drawing immense profits even as they poison and sicken the whole populations in their pursuit of depopulation. Under chaos, you know, the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein, during chaos, some people make more money. 
How did Jeff Bezos and Scott Elon Musk and make more money when we had this pandemic? Hmm, how does that happen? So, in conclusion, the globalist instigated American culture of death must be turned into a culture of life. So we have to find ways to make that happen. Ways to make that happen. So, <clears throat> people are protesting throughout the world on different scenarios. So we know Olympics is coming in 2024, as we go being a memory recovery specialist. How many people even know who Mumi Abu Jamal is? He just had his birthday, it's past April, April 24th, on 2024. So he is a political prisoner. Got to know about Mumi Abu Jamal. Why do I say you have to know? Because people over in France know him. They got streets named after him. Here we over here in America, we ignore him. We silence him as if he doesn't exist. And it's really because of our ignorance. But the brother is sitting in jail as a political prisoner and over in Paris, a Paris suburb named the street in his honor. The French collected for the liberation of Mumia. They have organizations and protests and you don't even know about them. Many of you don't know who weren't revolutionary. I know my brother Kalanji went and visited him in prison a few weeks ago. Uh, Black Power Media, but Kalanji, I mean, he keeps the uh, word out about where our revolutionary warriors are and what they're doing. But today, as he's honored in France, there's no way we should not know about him in America. But that shows the ignorance, that shows the propaganda power of the media to not let you know who those who have been fighting for you sitting in jail 42 plus years and here he is now uh, still challenged with his health but the Olympics I'm just saying that the Olympics the Paris when they had the Olympics in uh, Atlanta in 1996 they wanted to well Paris was trying to root for it and get it then and so back then they were coming over here asking about Mumia Abu Jamal as they were trying to you know host the Olympics, but it didn't happen. So they happen to have it here in 2024. Interesting with the coming politics of Olympics and the drama coming. Mm. Paris 2024, these these outfits here, people already protesting about these outfits, saying like stripper outfits. I mean, this one female is complaining about their body parts being shown. I'm not happy about it. Well, who designs this? And then you got France's uh, mascot for the Olympics. I don't know, this looks a little weird, but it says France's 2024 Olympic and Paralympic red triangle shaped mascots have been compared to an unlikely body part, the clitoris. Oh my goodness. Drama in the Olympics. So they say this this uh, mascot is really like the hat they use for the, Amer the French Revolution. It's called a pharyngean hat. Like, I guess Napoleon and how they wore it. People saying it's like a it's like a clitoris. Anyway, drama is coming for the 2024 Olympics. We also have drama coming for the 2024 presidential election. So, we know Biden's kind of in trouble because, hey, he's supporting this war against these oppressed people. Not four, not 14, 40,000 people massacred gone, wiped off the face of the earth. And the weaponry from this country has assisted that. That's why people are protesting. So he has a challenge. Beyond that, his other challenge is someone who would probably be in jail and still running as president. In jail and the president. Or waiting till after he becomes president because you got the Supreme Court saying and delaying the process of the prosecution of this individual. So we got drama on the Democrat and Republican side. Drama on the Democrat and Republican side, which then makes you say, well, then where do you stand? Who do you support? You gotta have, I don't know, not research and evidence. You gotta have some documentation on where people are. It's interesting that these individuals, and especially if you got Trump going to be the potential president. This is the best you have? This is your best? The world is watching. So, this new 
TV program called Flashpoint. Uh, it's, it's look inside the Christian TV show rallying Trump super fans with apocalyptic warnings, like we said about the Purge movies, and that's what it's all about. And change is coming, and you got a chance to kill the people without remorse and have no, you know, legal actions against you. And then so that we're moving to civil war. I mean, you saw what happened with the insurrection. When Trump was saying that it was fake elections or misconstrued elections. So that's coming. It's here. So they are still chanting the USA, USA, the, the MAGA stuff. And hmm, they're carrying the Bibles. So just talk about the Olympics. And they say that little mask of like a, like a clitoris. These people are supporting a man. Hmm, it's got some real shady past dealing with respecting women. Launched in 2020 and hosted by Pastor Gene Bailey, Flashpoint at times looks and sounds like other right wing cable programs. But unlike Fox News hosts, the rotating panel of conservative pastors and commentators on Flashpoint pepper their political analysis with messages that they say come directly from God. And now you're gonna vote for a man who grabs pussies. Excuse me. Oh, can't say that word? Well, whatever. That's who you're voting for? Sticking by? At no cost? America is in trouble. And so now we have to deal with that scenario of us as a people. Where do we stand? So as I conclude here, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, a book I have called Negroes and the Gun, The Black Tradition of Arms by Nicholas Johnson. Now, I'm gonna to, to read a, pas a passage here that really talks about the time period after Reconstruction. And what caught my attention here is because it was uh, the anniversary of the Coal Fax Massacre that happened 151 years ago in Louisiana. Coal Fax Massacre, you can go look up, at, look up that on your own. But I just wanna read like the stage of what was going on on those time frames of people protecting themselves. Uh, blacks were also a majority in regions of South Carolina. So I'm gonna talk a little about South Carolina and Louisiana and include here. Riding the wave of reconstruction, these black majorities gained powerful Republican friends, Republican friends in the legislature and the government's office. In the shadow of Negro rule, white Democrats form private rifle clubs, Democrats, shooting black people, and look for opportunities to provoke conflict with the black majority. So now, 150 years ago, the script has been flipped. 150 years, 50 years later, the script is flipped. So the issue does come down to who do you support? What is the agenda? What is the mission? Because they're going to wax and wane and change. Because really, you think about it, there's really one system, white people. You say it's Democrats and Republicans, but it's still those people controlling things. And right now, politics is very shady. In the shadow of Negro rule, white Democrats form these private clubs. With the advantage of numbers and at least nominal official support, blacks in this region sometimes prevailed against white political violence. A conflict in 1876 known as the Ned Tennant Riot is instructive, so it describes that uh, I don't want to go through that. You can read it on your own. While blacks lost this conflict in South Carolina, they did not lose every battle. In the village of Canhoy, just outside Charleston, black militia with superior numbers and firepower confronted whites who attempted to break up a Republican political meeting. Now blacks again were involved in it as Republicans. When the shooting stopped, five whites lay dead and 50 more were wounded. I won't show you those movies. While large black populations were a political threat, that did not always lead directly to interracial violence. Sometimes black voting power could be co-opted. Hmm. Wow, that means those individuals that I talked about earlier, like Ralph J. Bunch or Colin Powell or Lloyd Austin, I mean, Kamala Harris, people can be co-opted. And that generated interesting secondary turns of political violence. In 1875, before the effort to suppress black voting fully took hold, Democrats tried the carrot in addition to the stick. 
enticing selected Negroes into the party with various blandishments. And you can say that's now what the Republicans do to black people. Here the Democrats did it there, and now the Republicans are doing it here. One of these men, disgruntled Republican Martin Delaney, who was the man, Martin Delaney was the man, a former Union Army officer, medical, I think medical doctor, I mean, I got a book over there by Martin Delaney, he and David Walker have a book together. The address, I think. No time to find it right now. It says one of these men, disgruntled Republican, Martin Delaney, campaigned in earnest for South Carolina Democrats in the fall of 1876. Democratic Governor Wade Hampton also made overtures to Negroes. He was even accompanied by a mounted armed guard of 500 men led by ex-slave Richard Mack during the 1876 campaign. On election day, Hampton managed to garner roughly 5,000 black votes. For their part, black Republicans played very rough with fellow Negroes who were rumored to support the Democrats. Drama. 150 years ago, drama today. These early contrarians were threatened, beaten, and even shot at for their apostasy. Apostasy means like their insurrection or renunciation of, of, of another position. Uh, in heavily black districts of South Carolina, the shotgun policy politics of the rifle clubs alone was insufficient to secure victory for the Democrats. Ultimately, it took massive ballot fraud, wow, this is 150 years ago, to wrest control from the Republicans. In many places, blacks still managed to vote in large numbers and the ballot fraud was evidenced by returns in some white precincts that exceeded the voting population. <laughs> Is this why they keep talking about voter fraud today? Perched in the United States Senate, commenting on the violence, Ben Pitchfork Tillman reflected, we have done our level best. We have scratched our head to figure out how we can eliminate the last one of them. We stuffed ballot boxes. We shot them, Negroes. We are not ashamed. This is 150 years ago. You think things are really that changed when they're down trying to what say you can't vote unless you got a, a license, a specific license. You can't feed water, give people water if they have the ballot, if there are the voting percent games. The election season yielded the discord sowed by Governor Henry War Muff's machinations. The seat of power in Colfax was the courthouse, formerly one of Willie Calhoun's stables. I'm only reading this because I want you to look up Colfax massacre on your own, but it says when the local whites bragged with an earshot of their Negro help about the plans to take the courthouse and oust the Republican team, word soon reached William Ward. Ward raised the alarm with Republicans who armed for defense of the courthouse. Soon, two dozen black men with guns arrived to guard the courthouse and the Republican administration. We don't really talk about guns today but still part of our society. We got the National Rifle Association that doesn't want black people to be involved in that because somebody's got the guns. So what's going on today, you don't see the guns, but you do see intimidation. And that's why I was very bad with the last election. And we've continued on with the quote, fake election. So the fake counting. The last part here I want to read is the election commission, because I'm reading this because it really parallels some things that are going on today. The Election Commission's decision fueled competing claims to the presidency that some feared might lead again to war. And that movie just showed you Civil War. I tell you, these movies, these things are telling you what's happening, not just what's going on from the past, but as a memory recovery specialist, you got a process. The Democratic slogan of the time was Tilden or Fight. That was Sam Tilden. People in Brooklyn know a school named after Sam Tilden. Conflict was averted through negotiations in a literally smoke-filled room at the Warmster Hotel in Washington, D.C., where Southern Democrats ceded the presidency to the Republicans in exchange for economic stimulus, the removal of federal troops from the South, and home rule for Negroes. Like, don't give them the home rule. That's why Reconstruction after that 
Oh my goodness, we were not in good mood, in a good place. The country was weary of the Negro issue and anxious for reconciliation and a new prosperity. It should say the white country was anxious. And after this, Reconstruction was basically dead. And we had more people in politics that is African or melanated or melanin dominant people were more involved in politics back then than they are today. The end of Reconstruction opened the period some would call the Nadar, N-A-D-I-R. Nadar means the lowest point of the black experience in America. Hmm, but was it 150 years ago? Do we say today is the Nadar? How do we review history? If you don't know what happens in the past, you don't know how to conceptualize that. The political outlook was dim. Black political aspirations had been squashed by a program of violence and fraud and now by federal abdication. Many have chronicled the story, but one of the best summaries comes from a black man of the times. In 1884, black publisher T. Thomas Fortune said this, and I'll conclude from this. It is sufficient to know that anarchy prevailed in every southern state, that a black man's life was not worth the having, and those people being killed in Palestine, they don't look at them as people, that's why they're wiping them out like that. Are these animals? Hmm. Well, actually, people are doing it. Some of their animals. You can't restrain yourself not to do that. That armed bodies of men openly defy the Constitution of the not armed body defy the Constitution. That sounds like what that insurrection that happened here in America a few years ago. Openly defied the Constitution of the United States and nullified each and every one of its guarantees of citizenship to the colored man. Thousands of black men were shot down like sheep and not one of the assassins were ever hung by the neck until he was dead. And the next chapter is on the Nadar. Excellent book if you want to get some information about what's really going on in the past so you know what's really going on for the future. So I say you have been basically bamboozled and hoodwinked. If you don't read these books, you don't understand the information that people are presenting, if you won't, can't connect the dots, you're manipulated. So we've already seen that we've had a solar eclipse in 2024. I say some people's brains have been solar eclipsed. So as a memory recovery specialist, I'm going to say, stay on board for this wild ride for 2024. We'll be back. I'll be black. Thank you for listening.